Hello everyone, this webinar will start momentarily. If you experience any technical issues, please try logging out and logging back in. If we experience any technical issues on our side, please give us five to 10 minutes for a resolution. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today for this special webinar event. My name is Meredith Bonington, and I am a marketing specialist here at CFP Board. I'm happy to welcome you all to our webinar, How CFP Certification Helped Me. Today, we'll hear from a panel of CFP professionals as they discuss their path to CFP certification and how CFP certification has helped them stand out from the competition, build credibility in their field, better support clients, and advance their careers. Towards the end of our discussion, our panelists will also discuss any tips or advice they have for candidates currently pursuing CFP certification. If you have any questions during this webinar, please post them in our Q&A chat box down below. I will reserve a few minutes at the end of this webinar to take some questions from the audience. Now, with that being said, I'd like to transition now to our panelists, Amanda, Brian, and Henry, to briefly introduce themselves. Amanda, would you mind kicking us off? Sure. Thanks, Meredith. And hello, everyone. Um, my name is Amanda Valenti, and I'm currently a wealth advisor and the director of financial planning at CI Brightworth. Uh, we are a registered investment advisor um, with offices in Atlanta and Charlotte, and we are also part of the broader CI Private Wealth RIA, which has offices all over the country. Um, my background has been entirely in the financial planning world. My very first internship and then subsequent job out of college was doing comprehensive financial planning um, on a team at UBS. And this is my 16th year in financial planning, and this past February was my 10th year as a CFP. So I'm very excited to be here and look forward to hearing some questions. Well, that's great to hear. Thank you. Um, would you mind going next, Brian? Sure thing. Yeah, thanks for having me. My name is Brian Ruiz, and I am in a, one of two of a very small team. We are Divine Wealth Strategies out of Atlanta as well. And we are a registered investment advisor. We mostly deal with kind of um, people still mid-career, so a little bit of a younger crowd. And I've been there for about nine months now. I earned the letters in 2019. I have not been a career advisor or planner. I'm what I call a career meanderer, starting off in taxes and then doing some customer service work, and now back into planning. And love it and glad to be here. That's interesting. Thank you, Brian. Uh, and next, Henry. Hey, so my name is Henry Hahn. I live in the, uh, we're, we're located in the suburbs of Philadelphia. So we're uh, beginning to get engulfed in the smoke uh, of the Canadian wildfires. So that's always been cool to watch. Well, I guess that's a really bad way to phrase it. But uh, I um. I'm actually no longer officially a planner. I recently switched roles to join an equitable team as a director of investments. So investments are my pure focus. I still retain uh, a, a good handful of clients that I've built relationship as my, you know, from my prior life as an advisor. Uh, so I have a mix of both worlds and really enjoyed, you know, seeing, seeing all the different aspects that the industry can present and finally finding a home for myself. That's great to hear. Um, so now that we know a little bit more about our panelists, uh, let's jump into our discussion questions. To provide some more background, our first discussion question focuses on how each of our panelists entered financial planning. As many of us know, there are a variety of educational and career tracks that can enable you to enter this field and meander within it. Uh, Brian, would you mind starting us off? How did you enter financial planning? So I think, yeah, uh, this is uh, just a uh... A lot of soul searching, and I can mention a, I had a career path that I say meandered. But after graduating with degrees in accounting and insurance, I had the long-term goal of being a financial planner. Uh, that came about in undergrad. I took a personal financial planning class for myself and realized this is good stuff to know. And it turned out that my teacher was a CFP pro 
and he made a career out of it. So me being not a very gifted scholar, uh, I actually got an A in the class and it didn't feel like work to me. So it was <laughs> exciting, really loved it and had this, this idea of like, wow, this could be something. So initially I set out to be a, a tax accountant and that's what I did for a little while. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is in 2008, and then the recession hits us. I was laid off, and after the layoff, found myself at a bank, and in the bank, realized this is not what I want my career to be, started taking the required classes for the CFP exam, did well in those, and then set off to you know, sit for the exam. And That's great to hear, Brian. Uh, something... I think Brian's audio might have cut out for a second. Uh, just the point I wanted to make was it's really great to hear that um, uh, we hear from a lot of candidates when it, you um, you find financial planning, it's something that almost you know feels um, like you mentioned to your uh, coursework and your mentor, something that, that feels right and you love it and you almost fall into it. But we know that that's not necessarily, um, you know, to say that it's not something that you uh, have a, you know, prior uh, planned um, path to. So that kind of brings me to uh, my next question. I want to ask Amanda, what was your experience like as someone that, um, you know, did kind of follow um, you more of a, a, a planned path to financial planning in your um, educational experiences? Sure. So uh, just for a little bit of background, um, in college, I double majored in finance and accounting. And, you know, I did that so I could have a variety of different avenues that I could take um, once I graduated. Um, and I was looking for internships one day and I found an internship for a financial services intern and I did some research and thought, oh, wow, this is combining, you know, numbers and technical things with people. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm going to like that. Um, so I ended up getting the internship and worked with a woman advisor at UBS who was a CFP herself. And this was in 2007. And you know, the way that she had taught me and how she had been doing it for years was she led with planning. And at that time, we were a little bit of an anomaly within UBS. We would have people that would walk by us and say, you know, why are you doing all this planning stuff? Why, why don't you just go get the assets? Um, well, as you all know, and, and Brian alluded to this as well, 2008 came and it was a very scary time for all of our clients. You know, the stock market was going down, you know, there was just instability in the financial markets in general. And um, what was most notable for me being so young and in the industry was, you know, wow, we have so many other things that we can talk to our clients about rather than what their portfolio is doing. Um, so we could, you know, call up a client and, you know, instead of talking about how much their account had lost, we could, you know, remind them, you know, hey, we have planned for this and, you know, let's celebrate a small win. Like you, know, you got your state plan done or you used your 529 account to send your child to college. And so it just became very apparent that we had other things that we could talk to our clients about and not just investments. And, you know, as the came, as we came out of the great recession, you know, we had people that instead of, you know, asking us, why are you wasting your time on this planning? They were asking us to show them how to do planning. Um, oh, so wow. throughout this whole process, um, my boss really encouraged me to pursue the CFP. And so, I started going through the education component and taking the classes and just going through the Great Recession really cemented in me just how important financial planning is for people. And um, I was able to finish the education requirements, take the test in November and became certified in February of 2013. Oh, wow. that's an amazing perspective. Thank you for sharing, Amanda. And I kind of, you know, uh, speaking to the 2008 um recession almost speaks to the the necessity and the awareness of the need for financial planning. Um, my next question is towards Henry. Uh, would you mind sharing us how maybe you entered this field? Uh, is there any, um, you know, shared uh, experiences that you have with Brian and Amanda? Or did you have a different um, approach or a different um, entry into financial planning? No, I didn't actually, you know, it sounds like Brian and Amanda sort of kind of knew that this was the right direction that they wanted to go. Uh, I didn't actually follow that. I had no interest in financial planning. Uh, quite frankly, all I really cared about were the investments. Um, but it was sort of, uh, I'd call it having the right people at the right time in my life. Uh, people who kind of understood and had financial advisors in the past, they sort of pushed you in the right direction. And, and that's sort of what happened to me. You know, I had the right people surrounding me. Um, and they sort of put it in my face and said, look, 
This is the best way that you can sort of remain social and not have to sit behind a desk, but also do what you love, which is get to you know live in a world of chaos and, and embrace the idea that you can add value in everybody's lives, regardless of who they are. Uh, and that's a rare, rare place to be, um, you know, very rare industries in which you can honestly add solid value to every single person because finance is a complex world and, you know, the best people in the world and the good, the smartest people in the world, even they don't have the time to, to learn it all. So to be able to sort of do that all day, every day was sort of an exciting opportunity. So this was a, a good compromise for me. I sort of realized that this is a good place for me to be and, and, and a nice way for me to uh, stay involved with the investment world, but also be able to add value in everybody's lives. That's really great to hear. And, you know, it's something that uh, we hear echoed with, you know, candidates pursuing CFP certification is this idea of um, having uh, this work-life balance almost that a financial planning can bring. And it really is a, a meaningful addition to add about adding to people's people's lives and still staying within, you know, the financial industry. So that's a really great point. Um but now that our audience knows a little bit more about our panelists and how that you all um, entered the profession, um, my next question focuses on what inspired you all to pursue CFP certification. Uh, just as there's you know many paths to entering financial planning, there's also you know a variety of other motivating factors for earning CFP certification. Um, so just to you know, start broadly, Amanda, I know you mentioned that you know your employer had a lot of support for CFP certification, but what inspired you to pursue the marks? Uh, well, for me, you know, getting the marks was just a non, like not even a non-negotiable in my mind. It was, you know, very attuned to like this, a CPA and how a CPA is viewed in the accounting world. And I viewed the CFP the same way that if I wanted to, you know, give myself the best chance at having a successful career and, you know, being knowledgeable and having all of the tools within my tool belt to help different clients that getting the CFP was just something I had to do. And, you know, I'm a very, you know, uh, goal-minded person. And, and once I knew that that was, you know, how I could set myself apart, I knew I was going to do it. And so I, I went ahead and, and went through the process. Brian, what was your experience like? Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I had that teacher who was a CFP professional and that was kind of my, my kickstart of inspiration. And yeah, it was really kind of out of naivety what made me, that led me to get the letters because certified financial planner was the only certification I knew about. So good job on the marketing team. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, that was basically it. Uh, my dad is a doctor and he believes strongly in credentials and being certified where you are. So, or at least in your profession. So I, I thought this was a profession and that was to me, the certification to have. That's interesting to hear. And that also speaks to that sense of, um, trust and, um, uh, you know, uh, confidence in, in one's abilities with the marks that the marks can also provide. Uh, Henry, what was your experience? Um, you know, what inspired you to pursue CFP certification? And what did obtaining those marks mean to you? So mine's a little bit different. I mean, as far as inspirations are concerned, um, it's more cultural than anything else. I'm very traditional South Korean. I was raised in a household that, you know, was I'm essentially first generation American and part of that South Korean culture I guess the Asian culture is that we revere our elders and so what I mean by that is you look at them for wisdom expertise and you trust them you love them you trust them and you embrace what they have to teach so you know when you get into a field like this that is predominantly you know 55 and up the question is well why in the world would any client trust me over over the person next door who've been doing this for 30 years. I will never in, in five years be able to replace 30 years worth of, uh, worth of you know, on the job experience. And so for me, you know, just to age myself a little, I'm 31 years old. So for me, the best thing I could do to, to sort of level the playing field was to get educated. That was very self-driven. You know, I just thought if I, if I want to survive in this world and truly believe that I can actually help people and you know, actually make an impact. Part of that was I needed the biggest and broadest and baddest expectations and certifications that I could get my hands on. And this was it. So oh. I, I went for the best and the biggest and, you know, luckily I passed. 
that's great to hear. And and building off of this, this um, what you're speaking to kind of also alludes to um, you know, the the big why factor, which we'll definitely uh, dive in later on in our discussion. Um, but it, it's wonderful to hear that you know, regardless of uh, what inspired you, um, you know, how you got into financial planning, uh, how roads lead to this need to um, build. Uh, trust with your clients and and also like you said expand upon your your expertise and and uh, have your marks so next we'll briefly um, discuss the path to certification so I'm sure a lot of candidates on this call are um, you know going through their own pa uh, path to CFP certification and we all know that everyone's path looks a little different um, so if you wouldn't mind speaking just your experience as a candidate, you know, before you obtained your marks, um, Amanda, what was your path to certification like? Were there, you know, any challenges that you faced during this process and, you know, how did you overcome them? Sure. Um, so for me, I had to take the traditional route to certification. So um, back when I was looking to become a CFP, it wasn't a major at a college, you know, I couldn't get um, get that education requirement out of the way while also pursuing my degree. So I did it um, after I was graduated and I spent, you know, many nights for about a year and a half attending classes. Um, I, I was, I'm originally from Chicago. So this was back in Chicago. And I remember we had a little class of people. We all went through the, the education requirement together and, you know, we we were there for each other, you know, kind of having little study groups and, you know, talking about our experiences, you know, we were all working at the same time as well. So we were able to, you know, refer back to what we were doing in our day-to-day -day jobs um, with what we were learning um, in, uh, in the CFP classes as well. Um, so for me, it was, you know, going through that, that was a year and a half. And then once I was done with that, I needed to um, actually prepare to take the exam. Um, so I went through a um, review class. So I did a review class. That was a, a long weekend and, you know, just had to study my butt off for <laughs> several weeks. And so that, that was definitely the hardest part was just getting through the long days and nights of studying. And, you know, when I took it, it was a two day exam, um, where you had a Scantron. <laughs> so it's not a, it wasn't a computer-based exam at that time. And, um, I think one of the things that was helpful for me, but also a hindrance is I was also work doing financial planning in my day-to-day -day mm -hmm. job while I was studying for the exam. And sometimes I would want to refer to what I was learning and try and applying it to what I was doing um, in the job. And sometimes those things didn't always align. So um, it had it had its good things and its bad moments where you know, I would look back and say, okay, I'm learning this on the job, but I also have to remember that you know I'm, I'm studying for an exam and mm -hmm. you know it may not exactly line up with what I'm doing in my day to day job. I see. And, and Brian, did you have any similar experiences to Amanda? You know, when you were a candidate. Uh, yeah, I think the one thing that everyone shares is studying a lot. <laughs> But uh, I think mine was different. Uh, to me, it was very difficult. Uh, it's probably more of a personal thing than anything else. But I found it hard because, uh, first off, it, it's tough to find uh, like an entry-level financial planner, associate planner job that gets advertised as such and, and actually is associate planner role. So that was uh, my big hurdle was finding that experience. And then the other part was the exam itself. I took the exam four times. If there are any candidates here who have been on the forum for a while or maybe are new to the forum, you might see my name pop up a little bit. I've kind of gotten this reputation now for being something like a motivator or, or leader. I, I'm not naturally a leader. But I like to mentor candidates who have retaken the exam because I know that's a very difficult exam, the hardest exam I've ever taken personally, and that includes any accounting class. So mine was uh, not exactly linear either, but I really do feel like it was worth it. 
I see. And I we definitely, um, I have seen your uh, posts on the candidate forum, and I know that's been very helpful to others pursuing certification and, and maybe looking for, you know, next steps, what to do, um, you know, for another exam attempt. So uh, thank you for sharing. And Henry, I know you spoke a little bit about your path looking a little bit different to, you know, the financial planning profession and, and the financial world. Um, would you mind speaking to your experience, um, you know, on your path to certification and, and maybe also about taking the exam? I'll sort of, um, you know, I know Amanda and Brian talked about uh, studying a ton, which is, I think, factual. Um, but I'm going to actually hop on what Brian said about the forums. I think the hardest part about this test is there's so much to study and such a, you know, finite amount of time that people have to actually study. Nobody wants to study for four or five years. Well, I guess some people do. Uh, I surely did not. Um, and so part of it was, you know, the, the CFP board for everything that they do really well, it is no matter what, it's hard to sort of please everybody. Um, and in that regard, you know, there's not a concrete way that the CFP board or anybody can really suggest how to best go about studying. And I think that's the hardest part. You kind of just have to dive right in and figure things out on your own. And But uh, I really do think the CFP board has done a good job of making the mentorship program and the forum easily accessible. And, you know, that's what I did called a couple of people out of the blue that I didn't know. And I just said, what was the process like? And every CFP that I've interacted, when you ask them about that test has been nothing but enthusiastic about sharing insights. So um, that's sort of what I focused on. You know, I, whenever I get tossed off the deep end, I just call somebody, see what they did and, um, you know, at least get a starting point. Uh, but once you start and once you get in the flow of things, it's just time management at that point. Amanda and Brian pushed on it really well. It's just, trying to find the right time to study and, and, you know, making the sacrifices needed to, to accomplish something. And, and, and you know, there, there is a finite window. I mean, I think, uh, you know, while you can study indefinitely, I do think they're being able to see the end uh, of the road is something the CFP board has made for sort of priority, if you will. And uh, I think it has worked out pretty well. That's interesting to hear. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad to hear that some of the CFP board resources like the candidate forum and the mentor program are helpful. Um, for those in our audience, those are resources that we um, provide to candidates to help them connect with CFP professionals, um, you know, see, uh, as you said, Henry, um, you know, they've, you know, been in your shoes before, so to say, so you can kind of uh, almost hear a variety of different perspectives when um, approaching your, you know, your study plan. Um, and you can kind of see uh, what might work best for you, because as you know, you all mentioned that we all have different um, ways and methods that we we learn the best. So um Thank you. And moving on to our next question, which uh, ties into all of this. And the main point of our webinar today is um, how CFP certification has helped you. So now that you're on um, you know, the other side, um, you know, from candidate to CFP professional, um, many, is, many of us know that the CFP mark can signal to clients and employers that you know, you're a partner committed to putting your client's interests first. You know, and, and whether you want to deepen your commitment to financial planning or complement your other qualifications, that earning CFP certification can set you apart from the competition. So uh, just to start, Amanda, uh, put simply, how has CFP certification helped you in your career? Yeah, so for career wise, you know, I, again, worked at uh, UBS on a team and in those type of you know, businesses, so these broker dealers, you're essentially running your own mini business within, you know, the broader company. And so on my team, we were the planners and the advisors and investment research and operations all in one. Um, so when I was looking for kind of my next um, jump in my career, you know, I had all this really great experience, but without the CFP, my resume just looked like anybody else's that had worked with an advisor at a broker dealer. And so the CFP really set me apart um, from any others that may have been um, in the running for my next role, which happened to be at a RAA that focused on planning. Um, so I do feel like in, if I didn't have that CFP, then I wouldn't have gotten that job. Um, and, you know, now I'm on the other side of that in my role as a director of financial planning, I'm, I'm doing the recruiting for our financial planners and, you know, we will recruit them from out of school all the way up to, you know, having, you know, several years of experience and, 
you know, as part of our requirement to come into the firm and or move up in our career path, you know, getting a CFB is um, a part of those requirements. So not only did I find that it helped me you know, kind of land my next role and ultimately get me to where I am today, you know, we in turn are finding that those who are going out and pursuing the CFB are just showing how committed they are to the profession, to their clients. And, you know, we ask them to put in that sacrifice and um, get the CFP for themselves as well. That's great. And um, I know you just touched on this briefly, but um, since obtaining your CFP certification, you um, you also brought up just in your workplace working with clients. Um, how has your experience been working with clients since getting the marks and in, in, in your um, workplace? Have you, have you seen or heard of mm -hmm. a, a difference between how clients are receptive to the marks? Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, my, when I started, you know, my career and then where I'm at today, you know, I feel like I got my CFP right when financial planning really started to take off for, you know, the mainstream. Um, so our clients now know what a CFP is. They think of it in the same you know, kind of realm as they do like a CPA and an accountant. Um, and I have had, you know, prospects and clients say to me or say to colleagues, you know, I'm looking for a CFP. They, they won't say I'm looking for an advisor. I'm looking for a planner. They know and are educated on what the marks mean for the profession and how we work with clients. And so they're now making it a point to say, I'm not just looking for an advisor. I'm looking for someone who's a CFP as well. So I have seen clients become a lot more in tune and educated about what the marks mean. And, you know, they're now getting to the point where they're distinguishing those those professionals as, you know, people who are elevated above, you know, and anyone else who might be doing the same thing. That's really interesting. Um, and just to, you know, move this question over to Brian, um, you know, since obtaining, you know, your certification, what would you say has been the strongest benefit for you? I was looking for a job when I got the marks. So for me, it was really standing out. And basically any firm that was planning centric caught my attention. I ended up catching their attention. So it really just became more of a matter of fit and uh, culture more so than outright experience or even compensation. So that was what helped me out. And I feel like having the marks really does kind of set you apart in that you kind of dedicate yourself for this being an ongoing vocation and not just a job where you're collecting a paycheck. Mm -hmm. Would you say that since uh, you obtained your certification that you've seen, you know, an increased trust or, or confidence in, in your abilities? I have, and that's only recent just because I've only been client facing now for all of six months. And I, I do struggle a lot with imposter syndrome. And sometimes I have to remind myself that sort of CFP certification is a completely different level than, you know, the neighbor down the street with the hot stock tip or the TikTok influencer. You know, I, I am doing this as my real actual calling, if you will. So mm -hmm. having that in my back pocket has helped me out and digs me out of some situations as well as having a lot of customer service experience experience that I never thought I'd ever lean on and turns out not a lot of people have to deal with people yelling at them that's true and it's, it's uh, transferable skills as well as working with with people um Henry was your experience similar you know since obtaining your certification what would you say has been the strongest benefit to you um, I think I alluded to this earlier, but the biggest benefit for me really was an internal confidence. I mean, getting the CFP board doesn't randomly have people start calling you because, you know, you're the next greatest, best thing. You still have to do the work to build a book of business. Um, but doing that work and building that book of business with the CFP versus without looks dynamically different, at least mm -hmm. for me at a younger age, I had definitely found a stronger voice. And if you think about you know, what the role of a financial advisor or financial planner is, you're the leader, right? Uh, most people use their CPA as their trusted advisors, but if you think about what the CPA's role is, to look in the past, 
and lawyers and attorneys look in the future, right? They're trying to prevent anything going wrong in the future. Very few professions look at what's happening right now. Even doctors look at what's happened in the past and try to fix it. Right? You get sick in the past and you come in the, future, in, in the present. So being able to speak with a voice of confidence that I can help you right now uh, definitely made the, the journey through you know, client acquisition, speaking with clients, talking to people a little bit easier than if I didn't have the, the, the designation. That's really interesting to hear. Um, so it sounds like you'd say that, uh, you know, CFP certification has also expanded your industry knowledge. Am I, am I hearing that correctly? Yes, it definitely did. Um, I mean, as far as industry knowledge is concerned, you're, I, I, at least I am. I mean, I hope this isn't counterintuitive to what the CP, CFP board believe, but I don't actually believe it's humanly possible to know everything and anything about the, uh, the financial world. But at least when I walk into a meeting, I know that I at least am consciously aware of 95% of everything that's out there. So nothing will really throw me off guard. And I think being able to sort of walk in knowing that, uh, understanding that I've put the time in to learn about every aspect because the CFP board does cover every aspect. Um, being able to sort of have that air of, of you know, understanding that I'm not going to know everything, but at least I have a broad based knowledge that can get me pretty far. That's interesting to hear. Um, and, you know, it's nice. It's also, you know, speaking to what you've mentioned about, you know, having confidence in your abilities and yourself. I think that's a, a motivating factor for a lot of people who want to, you know, solidify, um, you know, their prior knowledge, their prior experiences with uh, the designation. So thank you for, um, you know, sharing that. Uh, we're going to, our last discussion question, uh, we're going to close out our discussion today hearing um, what advice that our panelists may have for candidates currently pursuing CFP certification and to also uh, speak more to their experiences. Um, so, you know, Henry, what advice would you have for candidates, you know, currently in the process? You know, do you have any tips on, on staying motivated or, um, you know, staying focused? Um. I think my best tip for staying motivated or staying focused really comes down to don't forget why you're doing this. Um, this is not supposed to be easy. I think people kind of walk in and expect that they'll, it's just another exam. Uh, I had always theoretically based on school grades had been a pretty decent test taker. Uh, but even I, I, I acknowledge beforehand that this is not something to take lightly, but you know, the difficult gets made easy by remembering why you're doing it. And uh, I think as long as you sort of stick to that and, and, you know, don't forget that the journey becomes a little bit more enjoyable. Thank you. And, and Brian, I know you mentioned you, um, your previous, uh, you know, experiences taking the exam a couple of times. Um, what would be the best piece of advice that you have for, you know, candidates? Uh, do you have any um, advice for those in the audience who um, may be taking um, the exam for a consecutive time or or uh, how they can be best uh, preparing for the next steps in the certification process? Yeah, absolutely. I Well, first off, I'll say don't do what I did. Um, don't take it four times. Right. <laughs> um, but to, to get a little more granular on that, um, you can't memorize for this exam. It really is uh, an exam of application and, in a way, skills. Uh, I mentioned I was never really academically gifted, so learning how to take the actual exam as far as the exam question and wording, that was something I had to learn. And I had to learn that this was a, 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 an application exam. So... My advice would be, to, especially anyone straight out of a CFP certification preparedness program, whether that's uh, the study, the pre-study for the exam, or just fresh out of school, is practice. It just takes a lot of practice to learn how to think for the exam. And this exam is hard because it's just so different. It's weird. It's it's You'll get questions for mentioning products that you've never heard of and you have to navigate what's appropriate in this question. What is the question really asking? So a lot of practice really helps with that. The more comfortable you can be with being uncomfortable and kind of 
digging at your weak points and making them stronger is always good. Sometimes the difference in passing can be as little as five to 10 questions and it's a really thin margin sometimes. So just polishing the little rough edges can be enough to pass. And I, I would say it doesn't have to be monumental if you're retaking the exam. You already know what it's like. So just try to improve even just 10%, which can be a handful of questions. You'll never know if those handful of questions are what put you over the top. But most importantly, I, I would say just stay curious with every question. Stay humble. Don't try to let your hubris of I've taken this before to lead you to the wrong answer. That's really great tips and, and advice. Uh, thank you, Brian. Um, and, I, and I hope it was motivating for, you know, anybody uh, in our audience that um, may be taking this, you know, for a, a second attempt or, or even just taking the exam uh, coming up soon. Um, Amanda, do you have any else that you know, you'd like to add to this conversation just in regards to you know, any advice you may have to uh, someone trying to pursue a CFP certification or, or enter this field? Yeah. Um, so I'll just reiterate, you know, Henry's advice about having a why that is going to be your guiding light as you're going through the, the long days of studying. And you may even need it when you're getting ready to sit down for the exam. So having your why, why you're doing this is, you know, going to be very important. Um, I will just share one other piece of advice that, you know, not only helped me, but also has helped, you know, some of the, the people that I work with who have taken the exam recently is, you know, don't neglect your, how you as a test taker operate in a testing environment um, for granted. So, you know, there is a lot of material. It is an application exam. You can't just memorize everything in order to get through it. But if you feel like you're not really a good test taker, um, make sure that you're accounting for that as well on the day of the exam. So, you know, have breathing exercises or ways that you can, you know, kind of focus your mind and, you know, be cognizant of what you may need to do personally to set yourself up for the exam and, and to have a good test, uh, have a good testing experience um, and not just focus solely on the material. Because if you find like, hey, I'm not really a good test taker, but you don't think about that until the day of the exam, you know, you might set yourself up for, you know, experience that doesn't go the way you want it to right from the beginning. Right. That's a really interesting point. And that kind of speaks to what we spoke to previously about how you know, since everyone's paths are different and everyone's also just different in terms of test taking and, and um, you know, absorbing material, you know, everyone's strategies are going to look a little different and it's almost finding that um, balance and rhythm into it. Um, so, you know, thank you for sharing. Um, and it, it looks like we do have um, enough time for some Q&A. Um, so, I just wanted to put this uh, slide up here first for our audience members. Um, here I have some helpful links for anybody wanting to read a little bit more in a given topic. Um, for instance, if you want to have a review or uh, look at any of our exam resources, you can go to cfp.net slash exam resources. We post everything there um, in you know PDF formats. You can make sure to, to read at your um, earliest convenience. Um, if you have any questions about the certification process, uh, you can visit uh, cfp.net slash become. Um, we also have an um, education program uh, finder tool where you can easily search and navigate, um, you know, for different um, education programs. That's at cfp.net slash programs. Um, and then, of course, you know, to create an account, um, you know, cfp.net slash account, if this is just your first introduction to, uh, you know, your path to CFP certification. Um, any additional questions I just wanted to mention that we may not get to in this Q&A, um, you can send them to getcertified2023 at cfpboard.org. Um, we will respond to your questions um, as soon as possible in that inbox, usually one or two business days. Um, and with that getting started, um, we have, like I said, we have some time to take Q&A questions. So if you haven't already, uh, please take a minute to enter any questions you may have in the Q&A chat box below. Um, now I see one question up that this may be uh, best directed to Amanda. There's a question about uh, finding a work-life balance while working and also studying. I know you talked about your um, experience uh, when you were pursuing CFP certification um, 
you know, while you were working in financial planning, would you mind, you know, maybe expanding on that a little bit more and talking about um, ways to find balance in your schedule while you're juggling these different things? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great, great question. And I don't have the magic answer on finding the right um, work-life balance during studying, because the reality is, is that studying for the CFP and deciding to pursue your CFP is a sacrifice. And you know, if you are working, you know, depending on the type of employer you're working with, they may or may not be receptive to you using work hours or, you know, using PTO for various things, you know, related to the exam, you know, so you have to be prepared to give up some element of your personal time to pursue the CFP. Um, you know, in my experience, my boss said, as long as I got all of my work done, she was comfortable with me using my work hours to study, which was very nice of her. Um, but I had a full workload, so I really couldn't take advantage of that. Um, I ended up just having to set a study schedule for myself. Um, you know, I said I would study, you know, one or two hours a night, and then maybe one or two hours on the weekend. And then I gave myself a break. You know, I think, you have to know yourself personally and know what you can handle um, in terms of studying. If you find that you can study for long hours, then take a weekend and get a lot of your study hours in then so that you can have some more time during the week to, to, to have that balance. But if you are like me and know that your um, ability to retain information goes down the longer you have the book open, you know, I just did mine in little short spurts. And, you know, gave myself permission to step away from the book and, and know that, you know, if I truly knew the information, stepping away for a couple of hours or stepping away for a day wasn't going to lose my progress. So um, I think overall, it's just understanding that it is a sacrifice, you are going to have to sacrifice some of your personal time. And, you know, if you can just plan to take the exam around a time of year when you know that your personal commitments might be a little bit on the slower end. It's a really good point. Um, and this kind of this follow up question kind of just relates to what you said. But, you know, do you have any tips for, you know, garnering, you know, employer support while going through all of this? I know you mentioned that you um, your employer played a, a role and even though you did have a full workload that you um, were able to kind of have discussions about, you know, other obligations that you had because you were pursuing designation. Do you have any tips on, on starting that dialogue or discussion with an employer? Yeah, yeah. And um, I've had, you know, I I'm a manager here. So I have, you know, 10 direct reports currently that are in various um, statuses of, you know, pursuing their CFP or, or have gotten the marks already. And, you know, again, it really, it depends on what type of job you're in now. And if the CFP is going to be viewed as an advantage, um, if you're a career changer, and you're looking to, you know, move out of a certain industry and into financial planning, this might not apply. Um, but, you know, for anyone that, you know, I talk to, you know, I really like to just hear how they're committing themselves to the exam and they're also committing themselves to their daily workload. So, you know, hearing them come to me with kind of a plan of, you know, here's how I'm, I'm going to get my work done, but I also really want to spend some time on the CFP, you know, and opening it up as a dialogue, um, is very helpful. And then, you know, me and this person can usually work through, you know, how how I can best support them in their pursuit of the CFP while also making sure that the work doesn't um, doesn't lag. So I think, you know, being prepared to have a discussion with your direct manager on what you think would be helpful for you and, and what you might need is going to be a more productive conversation than, you know, just walking into the door and saying, hey, I, I need some more, you know, support for my CFP and, and not really explaining why or what you need it for um, or how you'll plan to, you know, get your work done and, you know, utilize your time during the day or other support from your employer uh, to get it done. That's really great to hear. And, and, and especially from, you know, your perspective, um, you know, as, as a manager with direct reports, um, so I, I hope that that answered um, our audience member's question. Um, I now have a question um, that I can open up to the panel um, about practice exam, um, practice exam questions. Um, Brian, would you mind uh, speaking to um, one of our audience members um, is hearing that candidates should supplement taking practice exam questions along with their uh, regular routine studying. Um, would you mind just speaking to maybe your experience or, or what you um thought was most helpful as a candidate? I say that it doesn't hurt. 
uh, you you can't over prepare for this exam. You can't take too many practice questions. And I've seen that through my mentees as well. The multiple time test takers, there have been times where I've told them, you know this stuff. You just don't know how to go from what you know to showing it to the exam. And a lot of times it's just practice questions. So hearing different voices and the way that questions can be written by different people can always help you out because there will be at least one or two questions on the exam that you just have no idea. Uh, there are those ones that, are, that they're just weird. And uh, being ready and being prepared for them makes those questions a lot easier to navigate. I see. And that's something that, you know, we've we've heard um, quite frequently on, on the candidate forum and just um, from other people preparing is that, um, you know, there's nothing like getting something that will put you in the mindset and in the um, headspace of uh, taking the actual exam and something that's actually quite beneficial from our uh CFP board exam resources is that with your exam registration, there is a complimentary uh, 170 um, practice exam test. And this mimics the, it uses the exact, um, you know, formatting from the Prometric software that you would take on exam day. And it really mimics that exam day experience. So um, even like Amanda was saying, on like, you know, playing to your strengths when you are sitting for the exam and knowing yourself if you're a good test taker, doing breathing exercises. Um, you know, something we've heard is that, you know, having a practice exam and utilizing it is also um, a really great way to uh, mimic that test taking experience and, and, and see where you stand. Um, so thank you very much for sharing. Um, we have another question. Um, about the mentor program, I know um, Henry, you mentioned that you utilize that. Do you have any tips for starting that dialogue or selecting a mentor on the candidate forum? Um, I mean, I don't actually know how to find a mentor through the program, but I know my name is listed in there somewhere. But uh, I would that's where I would start. I would reach out to two or three mentors and go through an interview process. You know, the idea is everybody. You know, I've been listening to how Amanda and Brian sort of approach the test taking process, and I did it very differently. So everybody's going to be a little bit unique, and you kind of want to be able to bounce ideas and learn from someone that relates to who you are. And as Amanda sort of alluded to, uh, the key really is to find somebody who, you know, understands how you take your tests and what works best for you. Do you study long hours? Do you need, you know, do you not need those long hours? Uh, I think just treating the mentorship or search for a mentor more like an interview than anything else is, uh, is, is beneficial. Thank you. That's a good question. Um, for anybody who's interested or just has any questions on the mentor program, we do have that listed as an exam resource. Um, but, you know, as uh, Henry mentioned, there's just, um, it's on our candidate forum and, and you can have a, a direct dialogue with someone and request through their profile page. Um, so thank you for answering that. And uh, I see that we have one more question um, just about timing of the exam. So uh, I'm going to direct this question to Brian, considering, um, you know, your your background with taking the test um you know, for an, an additional time. Um, but what, what's your opinion on, you know, if someone needed to really postpone the exam or, um, you know, if they should um, sit for it just because it's already scheduled or if, or if they should postpone if there's external things going on, do you think that um, having the experience of taking it one time helps you in the long run or, or if someone's really not ready or not sure, um, how exactly would you um, approach um, knowing when it's when you're ready to actually take the exam or when you need to make a decision to uh, take more time. Right. So it is a very personal decision to make. That's first off. And uh, I'll preface this by saying everyone who takes the exam has that little bit of a feeling that if I just had two more weeks, I, 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 I'd be ready. And yeah, the truth is 98 or so, I don't know, there's no number, but most people who have passed the exam have had that thought. 
Now, the real question that I have asked some of my, some of my mentees with postponing or not, within two weeks, do you feel kind of calm and motivated and in a way ready to just not quote unquote get it over with, but do you feel ready to take this exam because you just don't feel like you don't really know how much more you can prepare? That's really the question. If you are going into that same time frame, you know, two weeks or so before the exam, and you're panicking because you know you're not doing as well as you were, yeah, maybe then it's time to consider to, mm -hmm. to postpone it. I mean, no one, no one ever regrets you know, taking the exam only once. You know, everyone, everyone I know is always upset that they have to put the time in again for the next time. I see. Um, it looks like we have time for just one or two more questions. Um, I'm seeing a question here uh, guided around uh, career paths after you know, certification. Uh, so someone here got their CFP mark in March, and they're wondering what other possibilities than just, um, you know, working at, you know, a, a bank or, or, you know, as a financial advisor or insurance company. And is just curious about the other possibilities. Uh, Henry, I know that your career has, you know, meandered and you've gone from, you know, being a financial advisor to moving on with investments. Would you mind just speaking a little bit to, um, you know, your career path and, and how um, you've engaged with this? So I think um, if the question surrounding what career path you have, there's a bunch of them, right? I think uh, if we look at the wirehouses or, or you know, the broker dealer format of being an advisor, uh, the first one's obvious. You can go to any firm anywhere and they're going to hire you because you have the CFP uh, and you can be an advisor. Obviously, that's one role. Um, the other role that's sort of blossoming within the, the independent channels. So outside of the Merrill's and Morgan's and things more like the Raymond James and the UBS and the Ameriprise franchises of the world. Um, you know, there are planning teams that now survive. I mean, just I came from Ameriprise and those Ameriprise advisors are trained to to uh, to do flat fee planning on top of, you know, being a fee based model. So they need teams to actually put those plans together and they want CFPs to, to head their their financial planning departments. So that's another route to go. And then, you know, obviously, I think, you know, the traditional being a, uh, a trusted bank advisor is also another option. So I think, you know, from there, but having the CFP mark is, you know, sort of sets the foundation for anywhere you want to go. I've historically never really had a problem at least having a conversation about roles that that exist. And it, it almost always starts with because I have the CFP exam, not because of who I am or what I do or what I look like. So. That's great to hear. And um, I'm going to pivot this question also to Amanda, considering that, you know, you are, uh, you manage your own team and, and you've, um, you know, with your career path, um, getting your CFP while you were working. Do you have any, um, you know, other things that you would want to add to to Henry's response on on career paths and then different um, paths that you can go with your CFP marks? Yeah, um, absolutely. I'd love to. Um, so, you know, the most obvious career path is to become an advisor and to have your own clients. Um, but, you know, to speak from the registered investment advisor world, also known as kind of that independent world, you know, we are actively exploring different career paths for CFPs. And in here, you know, we have your standard career path where you start off as a planner and then move up to advisor, but, you know, there's also a growing need for people that want to be that technical expert. So you start off as a more of a generalist, and then, you know, maybe you want to pivot into getting into a niche where you're um, being a technical planner for clients that are in a very specific industry, like an attorney or a doctor. Um, there's that opportunity as well. So if you're not so much of a client facing type person and, and you like the, the, uh, technical side of things. I think there's opportunities for you to lean into that. Um, the other opportunities are to go up through a leadership path. So that's the path that I'm currently on. It's a hybrid path where, you know, I have a leadership role within my firm and I'm also client facing. So I have my own clients and I will become a planner um, on other advisors' clients if they need somebody that's got um, 
a, a little bit more uh, years of experience, so to speak. So I think there's a variety of different ways that you can take it. And whether you choose to go into a small independent firm or a large independent firm, you know, that's a really, uh, that's a good interview question for you to have is, you know, what are some possible career paths for a financial planner to take within your company and, you know, let them kind of tell you the, the options. That's, that's great to hear. And, and thank you for answering that. I think that's, um, you know, a lot of people um, who, who may be attending this webinar, you know, have CFP certification help me. They uh, may be looking for, um, you know, next steps, especially after, you know, recently certified individuals. And um, it's great to hear that, you know, um, you know, there's a variety of different avenues that um, folks can take and, and try out and um, making sure that you can really um, hone in on, on all of those experiences to almost play into one another. So uh, thank you. And uh, I believe that's actually, you know, all we have for time today. Um, huge thank you to all of our panelists for sharing their experiences with us today. Um, and, and we hope that their experiences can help guide and motivate our audience members through the CFP certification preparation process. Um, to our audience members, thank you for attending today's webinar. Um, like I said previously, if you have any additional questions, please send them to the inbox shown above at getcertified2023 at cfpboard.org. Uh, we also have all of our resources posted on this slide above for you to review. Um, again, that's uh, getcertified2023 at cfpboard.org, and you should expect a response within one to two business days from us. Um, and again, we thank our panelists and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their afternoon.